The Kansas City Council business session for January 24 will now come to order. Um, first order of business is approval of minutes from the business session of January 17, 2013. Is there a motion? Move to approve. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, corrections, or additions? Hearing no discussion, uh, all in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. There are no opposed. The minutes are approved. Next item of business up for discussion is natural gas vehicle program update. Councilman Sharp. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, those of us who are, are second termers or in some cases third and fourth termers are, are a little more familiar with uh, the leadership role Kansas City's played at a national level on uh, utilizing uh, CNG vehicles. Uh, and, and we've been recognized at the national level in the National League of Cities for doing it, but we haven't had an update for a while. And... Uh, uh, there have been some new developments, particularly uh, involved with the uh, legislation to avoid the fiscal cliff that, that is very, very beneficial. So I just thought it was appropriate to uh, have Sam and, and uh, Mr. Huffer from, from the ATO, ATA over to kind of bring us up to speed and, and let us and the public know what we're doing on this. Thank you, Councilman Sharp. Hi, Sam. Hey. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor and members of the council, um, I want to thank uh, Councilman Sharp for inviting me up. I, I always enjoy it. This is my favorite subject is alternative fuels. So, and we got to get you out more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, now, uh, like Councilman Sharp said, a um, uh, few of you have seen this presentation, so I, I kind of whittled it down some to, in the interest of time. So I'm going to get us up to date. Can I give you a little history of uh, how we got where we are? By all means. And then uh, turn it over to Mr. Huffer to sure. uh, kind of. Uh, tell what they're doing. So, yes, I am uh, Sam Swearingen, your fleet administrator. Um, and to get this thing going, uh, if you look at the screen here, um, prepared a presentation just real quick. Um, we have about 3,000 vehicles um, total. Uh, now, that does not include KCATA. It does include the buses at the airport, but we have about 3,000 powered units. Um, of those powered units, um, about 1,700 use gasoline. And in the state of Missouri, there's a 10% ethanol mandate. So uh, about 1,700 of our vehicles use 10% uh, ethanol. And that's not consistent across the nation. That's, it is unique to some Midwestern states. Um, we also have about 1,000 units that run diesel. And depending on the price of diesel, uh, we can run up to a 20% blend. So if you hear the term B, than a number like B10, B20, that's the percent of bioproduct in the petroleum product. So like B20 would be 20% pure biodiesel mixed with 80% petroleum diesel. Currently, we are using none, but that might change. Again, um, with biodiesel, um, it's the cost of the fuel at times, like it is right now, is more expensive than petroleum, and it really impacts our budget. So I'm kind of limited on what I can do with biodiesel because it is more expensive. Um, like Councilman Sharp said, there's some, been some legislation on the uh, production side of it. So we might be able to see a cheaper price in biodiesel, and if that happens, we'll implement it because we've had success in the past with it. Uh, what we're known nationally for and what I speak on all the time is our natural gas program. Uh, currently, we have uh, 300 vehicles, and that's growing. Um, we do have other alternative fuel vehicles, and when you look at the um, the 31 there, um, electric, that's not what you think. Uh, we only have a few pure electric on-road vehicles. The, those That 31 number represents forklifts, uh, arrow boards that tell you which way to go, uh, construction type equipment. So that's what that represents. And... Um, I gave this presentation, this same old one I've been given for a long time, I just update it. And I gave this presentation to my staff some time ago, so I've got to apologize for everybody that's seen this presentation before because the same lame joke is in here. This mechanic said to me, hey, Sam, you ride your bike to school, uh, I mean school, yeah, to work. Um, you know, what about that? So I include that, so there's one, <laughs> one squirrel. Are you Sorry. the squirrel or I'm is the, the bike the squirrel? Well, it's a combination, but I think he was referring to me. Okay. 
So anyway, do we laugh now? And <laughs> Sam, uh, uh, just uh, I, I, I don't want to take a vote on it or anything, but I, I sense that there might be some desire that you upgrade the joke too. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a ten-year-old joke, and it's kind of become my shtick. People yeah, expect- nobody laughed ten you, years yeah. ago either. <laughs> Talk to Ed. Talk to Ed Ford. He'll. No, don't do that. He practices at night. You need more material. Moving on. So currently, as we speak, about 15% of the fleets using alternative fuels, and like I say, with diesel fuel, they can really jump up fast. But uh, again, the natural gas program is what makes the biggest difference. But just to give you a little history on our biodiesel, we did use, and then 2006, we used up to 350,000 gallons when we went to a B50 blend. But you got to remember that uh, diesel trucks changed uh, in 2007, and they also changed in 2010. I'll go over that a little bit later. Uh, but um, And it made it a little bit more difficult to run biodiesel because uh, the filters are really tight. There's a lot of close tolerances on modern-day diesels, and uh, biodiesel has a higher gel point. So long story short, it plugs the filters. So... Uh, it's a, just a challenge you got to deal with. So the biggest year that we had using biodiesel was in 2006. And then uh, here's the exciting part about CNG. It's kind of a busy slide. But historically, we've used 500,000 gallons fairly consistently. Um, well, with some grants, uh, we were able to increase the fleet. So you can see in 2011, uh, for the total fleet, we jumped up to 540, and then just last year we're up to 620,000 gallons, and that's going to be even more this fiscal, uh, this calendar year as well. Um, and what's really significant about those two years is, uh, like Councilman Sharp was saying, uh, with the fiscal cliff agreement, some tax rebates were included. That's 50 cents a gallon, gas gallon equivalent for natural gas. So that represents about a half a million dollars to the city of Kansas City that we're applying for with the IRS to get a rebate. Um, we have five. We currently have five stations, and I'll show you in just a minute where they're at. Um, our current price for um, gas gallon equivalent is about a dollar sixty. Um, we are, right now are running about a two dollar differential between the cost of of um, diesel and the cost of natural gas. So if you think about that, it's a significant savings. Uh, several studies that we've done showed that last fiscal year we saved a million dollars. In other words, let me put it a different way. Our fuel bill is a million dollars cheaper because we're running natural gas. It would have been a million dollars higher if we would have just stayed the course with diesel. Um, And like I say, historically, it's been that way since... um, we started the program in 1998. And this all started under uh, clear back in the early 90s. And uh, believe it or not, I've been fortunate enough to be part of this since the very beginning when it started in 1990. Um, and this kind of just goes over how we, we got to where we are. We started off small with one station then expanded. And um, we wouldn't be able to do that without grants because um, the price – the price differential is something that's been happening recently. Uh, we started off doing this for environmental reasons um, because natural gas historically has been a lot cleaner than the petroleum fuels. Um, but we aggressively pr- pursue grants. That's how we keep the program going. Uh, money's tight. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that we landed that big $4 million AA, uh, ARA grant um, that put 174 all fuel vehicles on the road, and most of them were natural gas. And uh, I, I know we got to toot our own horn, but that's difficult for me. But uh, so I was asked to put our awards up there. We've won a lot of them through the years. Most recently, the uh, sorry, Sam, but we want to hear them. Well, the most no. recent one was Government Fleet Magazines. We won their uh, uh, 2012 uh, National Fleet Leadership Award. Uh, don't don't press the button. There's a lot of people who may be watching this at some point in time, and they don't have any idea. And we hear all sorts of stuff when we do something wrong. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and say what we've done right, and please go through each and every one. Okay. Well, uh, 
the thing that's unique about Kansas City historically has been uh, I compete against other cities like Los Angeles, uh, New York, Houston, and the unique, unique thing about us is, and the reason why we get so much credit, is those cities are forced to do something because of their air quality problems. We got air quality problems too, but everything we've done has been 100% voluntary. So that's the so we've been called the largest voluntary alt fuel fleet in the nation for a long time. Now other fleets, because of this price differential between natural gas and diesel, are catching up, and there might be even a few that have surpassed us. Uh, but we're right up there. We're, we're, we are considered a leadership, and I, I, I do these presentations all the time. And this is the one I give, so I, and I'll change the joke. <laughs> <laughs> but you still haven't gone through the rest of the well, awards, Sam. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the next one is the Government Fleet Magazine's 2009-2012 National Fleet Environmental Leadership Award. What's that one about? Um, the Government Fleet Magazine uh, does an annual uh, – that's a pretty big application, actually. I have a good staff. Uh, Jody Frisbee on my staff fills out that application every year. Uh, and we were ranked. They, they have what's called um, sustainability awards, and that's what those two are about. And then, then we get ranked. And um, the 100 best fleets is we were ranked 18th uh, in the nation. And, again, I'm competing against cities that are mandated to do this. Do your um, mouse for a second. Huh? Can you do your Shake mouse. your mouse. Shake your mouse. He kicked it. He oh, kicked it. Okay. That's all right. Yeah. Just keep reading. Oh, you, can, you guys have it down there. I didn't even realize that. No, we did. I'm looking over we here. Did. And we it did. We did. Uh, gone now. Is it back? <laughs> no. No, that's all right. That's all right. Just take. Just finish your slide, though. Okay. Um, and then uh, Kansas City Regional Clean Cities, uh, the 2008 uh, Agent of Change, um, National Fleet Administrators, 2008 National Green Fleet Award. Um, the, the 2007 Oxygen Award was a big one. That was, we were recognized as the leader in the nation in 2007. Um, Sustain Lane, again, uh, we were ranked third <coughs> in the nation in 2006. Um, that was back when we were using all the biodiesel I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, clear back as far as 2001, we were called the Movers and Shakers. We received that from the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and then the Kansas City Regional Clean Cities uh, Coalition recognized us uh, uh, in, in year 2000. So there you go. Thank you. We I don't know why it's so tough, but it, 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 it's hard for me to toot get, my own Get arm. over it. All right. Um, get over it. <laughs> we, we, we need to learn to talk about the good things in this city, and you're the person on the front lines here, so we're kind of relying on you to say okay. the good stuff because I guarantee you when people have bad stuff to say, there's all sorts of people shouting it from the rooftop, so you've got to take on that role all right, I'll and change it. that joke. All right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to Ed. All right. Now, I think it's important that we kind of understand the history of all this, too. 2005 was a big year for the city, and it kind of went, it, it, the public didn't realize it because most citizens drive gasoline vehicles. But when Contrita hit, um, the uh, pipeline that feeds petroleum to this area, uh, the Magellan Pipeline, comes down to Fairfax. That's the main uh, petroleum pipeline that feeds this area. It went down. So we had, a, we had a regional shortage of diesel fuel in 2005, and uh, our prices went through the roof. So that's when we realized, you know, we started studying how vulnerable we are to uh, price shocks, shortages. I had to, we had to uh, uh, get fuel as far away as Indianapolis, if that gives you the degree of the problem. And it's happened to Atlanta, too. The Colonial Pipeline went down, and Atlanta was faced with the same thing a couple years later. So the focus kind of changed uh, from environmental, environmental is still important, uh, to energy security, because 2005, a lot of different things happened. I'm going to go over them just right fast. I'm going to make this. This is the part of this, the presentation. I, I cut a lot of slides out in the interest of time, but I think you, there's a lot of misinformation about our nation's situation with petroleum, and I think it's important to go over this again because it hasn't changed. In 2005, NREL, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, said we were uh, into, coming into a perfect storm. <coughs> And what that means is our, our consumption 
was separating from our, as consumption was increasing, our production of oil was decreasing. Okay, and this was, they predicted that there would be high prices. Okay, uh, we were going to get in an area of instability. And here lately, because North Dakota, and nothing against North Dakota or the North Dakotans or what they're doing up there or fracking or any of that, um, but a lot of you hear in the media that it's being portrayed as like the national savior of oil and that we can drill our way out of things. Well, with the graph that you see here is um, historically the production of oil. Uh, the, uh, the dark green is total production, the light green is the lower 48, and the blue is Alaska. And you can see that there's, there is an uptick uh, there at the, to the right of the graph, and that is North Dakota, okay? They're making millions up there. Nothing wrong with that. Is it going to save us? You know, no, it's not. We're still importing 8 million barrels a day. They're never going to come anywhere close to that. So this whole notion that we can drill our way out of something, I'm just looking at the facts. Um, it, it, it ain't going to happen with just petroleum. You know, looking at his, uh, the history of the situation, that first uptick uh, after the peak, this is another graph of our oil production. The first uptick was Alaska, okay? Well, this, that second lower one in the black, that is Bakken. That's con consideration of North Dakota. It's just going to uh, delay the decline. And I was, I was in uh, Houston giving this presentation uh, for Galveston Clean Cities and uh, in the thick of the oil, there's a lot of oil folks in the audience, and one guy spoke up and said, he didn't, he didn't disagree with any of my graphs because they're all government stuff, but they're from EIA. Uh, he said, well, you don't have anything from the industry. So I took note of that, just like I will the joke, and uh, <laughs> I, put up, I put up BP, and the red is what we're importing. This is from their industry. This is not from the government. This is from the BP, uh, British Petroleum Statistical Review, that agrees, basically, with EIA, we're importing about 8 million barrels a day, so even from their own industry. So that the slide that we showed early, uh, earlier of NREL, 2005, still holds, holds true today. There's still a wide gap between what we consume and what we produce. And real quick, um, looking to the far right, this is global oil production. This is the reason why things in 2005 was a real game changer. changer. If you look over to the right, uh, well, actually, following along the years, starting there in 1980, as demand increased, production increased, and we went happily a, you know, along our way. This is globally, all right up until 2005. And since 2005 until now, if we look at the far right and analyze it, despite demand, global pr production has remained flat. And that's what's causing the instability. Uh, demand has outstripped supply. Okay. And this is one slide that I added that I thought was almost kind of comical. Uh, our own EIA, Department of uh, Energy, is saying that they're expecting global that, you know, to do just like our domestic supply and peak at some point. And so this is their predictions, and they're saying that that big wide gap there uh, is uh, unidentified projects. I mean, we're supposed to meet demand with, uh, with what? Because if you look at what's been discovered, the gigantic... Uh, oil fields were all discovered 50 years ago. We've already tapped them. We've already, you know, drawn oil out of them. So I call the ones there in the 50s and the 60s the water mains. Um, I know Terry Leeds is here. Sorry, Terry. But, uh, and the ones from 2000 to 2006 down there are soda straws. So we're relying on soda straws, thousands of them, to replace the big water mains of Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Russia, United States. So we're going, trying to the Arctic. Uh, anyway, and it's not a partisan thing. Um, the GAO has said this. George Bush said this. Barack Obama said this. Our military has said the same thing. I mean, that, 
This was in 2010. Nobody's talking about global oil production being at 118 million barrels a day anymore. That number's just not realistic. So I agree with the, uh, the uh, IEA in saying that the era of cheap oil is over. So the whole point of this whole big deal is just to re reiterate the fact that I think we're still, the decision we made clear back in the early 90s was the correct one to, to make. Um, nothing's changed. Um, we made the right decision. Because we just got to go back to 2008 to see the diesel fuel, the first price shock, diesel fuel shot up to just about $5 a gallon. And a lot of people say, well, what's happened? How come, you know, how come it's not seven, eight dollars a gallon? This this graph here is uh, vehicle miles traveled. And if you look, you can see that from 2005 till now, in the United States, we were driving less by a lot. I mean, we, that's what's really saved the thing, because that, that correlates exactly with um, the supply-demand uh, problem I was talking about earlier. So we're back back to square one. So what's our best choice? Uh, for large trucks, out of, the, out of the choices I have today, um, we still think natural gas is the right way to go. Uh, there are some other promising technologies out there. I'm not poo-pooing them. I'm just saying that for what we're doing, the best bang for the buck is still natural gas. Um, you know, historically it's been, it hasn't got any respect, but it's starting to get more respect all the time. Uh, more people are joining us. Why? Because it's cleaner, it's still cleaner, it's still cheaper, and it's, and it's domestic. And just real quickly, a lot of people that I talk to want to compare natural gas vehicles with old diesels, and they ask me, do they get the same mileage? And I say, no, the natural gas vehicles get slightly less mileage than your old diesel one. But if you compare it to um, a new diesel, they get comparable mi mileage. And the reason why is because um, to get diesels in that little bitty clean green box down there to lower the particulates and lower the, 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 the other pollutants that are in uh, diesel, it's a lot harder to do. In 2007 and again in 2010, we even had to change our, the formulation of the fuel itself to get remove all the sulfur. And that's what that little, we had to go from 500 parts per million down to 15 parts per million just so the after treatment devices would work. And the reason why we had to do that <coughs> is because diesel fuel is very, inherently dirty. Um, the, the molecule on the bottom is the chemical soup that, that diesel fuel is. Methane is uh, natural gas, CH4. It's 80% hydrogen. So it's inherently cleaner, easier to clean up. A simple catalytic converter can do it. And I'm not one of these guys that's going to tell you as far as our domestic reserves that we have a 100 years supply. <coughs> I'm uh, more in the camp that we'll see because I think it's, there's a, there is a little bit of hype there. But I can tell you that for the trucks that we buy today, we have plenty of supply, and it's, it's going to be more stable than petroleum. I don't know about the 100-year supply. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll see about that. But for the trucks and equipment that we buy today, natural, for, the, for their lifespan, natural gas is going to be more, a more stable uh, cheaper fuel. So I'm going to show from here on in. I get off my soapbox and I'll show you some pictures of the fleet, and then we can answer any questions. So um, we bought um, quite a few Hondas through the years because uh, Honda's been very consistent in providing um, a um, from the factory uh, sedan, and they are our lowest cost per mile on-road vehicle. Um, we're nothing. I'm not knocking Ford. Ford didn't make a product, so we had to buy a kit, uh, a CNG kit. We've had some issues with these, with with this. I'm a, I like laying it on the line. Um, so uh, we've had some cold weather start issues that are unique to this particular vehicle because of the kit that's on it. And we're working with that kit manufacturer to get the problems rectified, and we haven't. We're not there yet. So. These have been, they, they run fine most of the time, but the last couple of days, uh, Dr. Archer is ready to wring my neck. 
because these haven't been starting. Um, real good van uh, kit. This is also a kit, uh, different, made by a different manufacturer, BAF. We've had real good luck with it. Real good luck with all of our pickups. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea, the natural gas tanks are bigger, so in a pickup application, you'll see that it takes up the bed. That is one of the drawbacks. Uh, Full-size van is a very good application. Uh, a lot of our vans, we can even tuck the tanks up underneath, and you don't even notice. You can't even tell it's a, a natural gas vehicle. And we have more vans than probably anything else. I have at least 60 of these in the fleet. Um, as we move forward and we don't have to rely on grants, this might be an option that we want to we want to do. This particular truck um, runs on both gasoline and natural gas, so you can take your choice just by flipping a switch. Uh, grants don't allow that. I, I actually got this vehicle uh, from a dealer that ordered, he thought he was going to order propane, and he made a, an error on his order form. And this is down in Tipton, Missouri, and uh, they said, well, that crazy guy in Kansas City might buy it from you. You know, they're, they're on natural gas. So we got this the, without grants on a steel because he was unloading it. We have uh, lawn mowing equipment. Um, Kansas City uh, still has uh, ozone alert days, you know. So our air is still bad, you know, when, in the summertime. So uh, these put out virtually no emissions. So we, uh, the park department uh, is running those during ozone alert days. We have about eight of them right now. A lot of different applications. It's a utility truck in the water department. There's we have 35 buses at the airport, and again, just those 35 buses. Bus applications are so good for natural gas because they use a lot of fuel. Uh, the, just 35 buses at the airport use more than my entire fleet. The rest of the fleet. But that's going to be changing because we're buying more and more of this type of equipment. Um, and again, uh, this particular application, the first couple of these that we got, uh, we had some issues with because, again, we were first in the nation to get this. Uh, we got these units on uh, grant. Um, and I've got some really sharp technicians that have been working with the manufacturer, and uh, we're working our way through the issues, and they've been, you know, we're improving the durability of them. Because, again, that's not the engine that was supplied in this truck was not uh, original manufactured. Another application. And then we got 12 of these freight liners for public works, and we've got um, about a half a dozen for the water department. And because of, here you go, Mr. Mayor, because of our leadership, <laughs> purchasing the first in the nation from the other manufacturer that caught, this really did. This caught the attention of Freightliner, and they said they had to get in the game, and they actually leapfrogged International and provided uh, the Westport Cummins natural gas engine from the factory. So these have been bulletproof. Hmm. These have been bulletproof. Outstanding. And that's the same engine that we'll be putting in the buses, and um, it's very durable. It's made by a company called Westport Cummins. And the second generation of the ones from International – uh, we haven't had any problems with them either. It's just those very first ones. Um, so these are recycling units that uh, Michael Shaw uses in our solid waste division. There's seven of those uh, going through the community. Clean, you know, Again, these are a lot cleaner burning than uh, diesel. Picture of some of our stations. Four of our stations. <laughs> That's the big CNG uh, station up at the airport. Uh, Location-wise, the red, the red and yellow dots there are the are where the stations are located. Uh, Kansas City is pretty uh, challenging because it's geographically long, north and south. And the new station that we're talking about putting an end down for public works is actually in that little triangle. It's right in the middle of that little triangle is the next station we're going to put in down at uh, 5300 Municipal, and that's kind of a site plan for that station. And it will include a uh, public dispenser, which will be our first one that will allow the public uh, to come up and fill at our station. So we're really excited about that. I get because I get that all the time that when you're going to open them up to the public. So that'll be our first one. And one of these days, that's a, this is a 12-year-old picture. Maybe the public will be able to feel them like we have been doing for a long time. And I got just a couple more slides. Um, just so you know, I'm not like a, you know, 
blinders on with natural gas. We do buy other types of vehicles. This is a Smith Electric vehicle that uh, we got a grant for, and um, it's in our park department, and they're using it um, trimming trees and working on uh, telephone light, you know, the lights. So it's working good in that application. And you've probably seen this one in the City Hall garage. This is a pure electric um, Ford Transit Connect. And the grant that we applied for through ARA also provided for electric charging stations that we installed in the Kaufman Center, the Performing Arts. And the umbrella, uh, the umbrella grant, the $15 million grant that uh, the Kansas City Regional Clean Cities got, that we got $5 million of, um, it provided um, charging stations throughout the city. So there's my squirrel. All right, so we're back to the again. Thank you a lot. Thanks. That's my presentation. I hope it wasn't too long, because uh, Mark Huffer does is going to be up next um, to kind of give update on KCA, what KCATA is doing. Councilman Sharp, and don't we have some street swe street sweepers on order? Yep, we do. And uh, I don't have any pictures of those because they are on order. But we have eight street sweepers that are on order. Um, that will again significantly increase our amount of uh, CNG usage. Councilman Glover. Quick question, Ed. Um, thank you for the presentation, and the progress is very good and, and needed and necessary. How do we take this progress that the Municipal Corporation of Kansas City has been making on its own fleet and take it out into the community at large to encourage other corporate entities and other fleet usage for clean vehicles um, exactly that's exactly what we're trying to do this year and the the next step is providing that that public dispenser the public cng dispenser so that's what we plan to get accomplished this year that so, is the next step so we're actively going out and talking to other entities in kansas city missouri corporate entities about the advantages of this oh they're coming to me oh good i get i get phone calls all the time i mean it's yeah but yeah we'll but once we get that once we get that dispenser in um then yeah we'll do some outreach uh i am actively a part of kansas city regional clean cities and they are the alt fuel um uh, exchange for our region they're the clearing house so and we're i've been the missouri co-chair for the kansas city regional clean cities for the last eight years so well, I remember when we bought our first fleet, the idea was to be a leader in the community so other people would do what we're, we're right. doing. Yep. And that's important. Yep. Councilman Wagner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just jumping off of uh, Councilman Glover's comments, and, and of course, Councilman Sharp, myself, uh, Councilman Davis have been working with CNG to try to get them uh, more into this market. And I think ultimately, um, there's a private sector interest to do exactly what you're talking about, and it all comes down to the ability and availability of public facilities where they can use uh, CNG, <coughs> uh, compressed natural gas. And so we've been trying to uh, assist them uh, to, to find those areas, find those opportunities. But I think that's the ultimate answer. When the supply is there, then I think the demand comes along with it. Yeah. I would agree. Thank you, Councilman mm -hmm. Wagner. Anyone else? If, if Councilman I could, Sharp. Uh, what, what is the schedule for the next station? Because I, I totally agree with the comments of Councilman Glover and Councilman Wagner. Uh, uh, we, we want to not only be an example, but we want to help facilitate uh, other corporations in, in the city using these cleaner burning vehicles and, and saving money in the process. And if you don't have enough fueling stations uh, or, or hardly any fueling stations, it just retards <coughs> the progress. So. Kind of, kind of what is the schedule for the, for the well, station I, that's going to be on municipal? Yeah, it's going to be at 5300 municipal. Um, we have uh, completed the uh, selection process for the phase two environmental, okay. so that's been done. A requisition's been cut for that for that work, and um, we're moving forward with uh, the contract. So that's about where we're at. So as far as a timeline, um, I'm, cautious, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can get it done by this fall, I'm hoping. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Sharp. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Sam. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. Mr. Huffer. 
Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the um, City Council. That's a tough presentation to follow, so, um, and I promise I won't tell you a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, following the city's lead, um, we are very actively committed into using alternative fuels as well. Um, I think in our fleet you've probably seen that we do have a Smith Electric truck that we use for cleaning shelters. Um, we have five hybrid MAX buses uh, that were part of the Truce MAX project. Um, many of our supervisor vehicles are hybrids. Um, this summer we're going to be installing propane on many of our non-revenue vehicles. And in July of this past year, July 2012, the ATA Board of Commissioners passed a resolution stating that from now on all future bu bus purchases would be CNG. Right. So we have um, two, buses, two CNG buses on order that will be delivered actually in March. Um, and until the period that we have our own fueling facility, we'll be f working with Sam and fueling them at the city's facility. So uh, we're very appreciative of the support Sam's given us and uh, really has made it easy for us to get those filled. Uh, currently we are out to bid, and those bids are due within two weeks, on another 22 to 25 buses, and those will be CNG. Um, we anticipate delivery of those would occur in about 2014. Um, one of the things that we're just now looking at and that is um, very intriguing to us is how to reduce the cost of the buses. A new CNG bus, full-size heavy-duty bus, is almost $500,000 um, with, from time of order, about a 14-month delivery timetable. We have found a couple of firms that can actually rehab an old diesel bus into a CNG um, with a complete rehab that makes it, again, a 12-year bus, has the full FTA, 12-year uh, standard, and they actually rehab it to such a difference that it has a new VIN number. So it practically comes out as a brand-new bus um, at a less than half the cost of ordering one and a fraction of the timeline. And obviously for us, to get our capital costs back, the quicker we can get more CNG buses in because of the fuel savings costs, the quicker the return of investment on our initial capital costs. So this is a real intriguing prospect for us. Uh, it will greatly speed up the time that we can have more vehicles in service, both because the dollars will go twice as far and the delivery time is a fraction of it. So we're looking into that and hope to have some decisions made on that within the next couple of months, and uh, we'll be viewing the, that uh, factory to determine their capacity and viability as well. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at, and, and Sam Bree mentioned it a little bit, um, we obviously have to make a significant facility conversion to go from diesel fueling to CNG. Currently, our thought process is we own land at 18th and Troost, and we are looking at a joint development project that would make a facility there close to ATA buses but also have a component of uh, public fueling so that we could put a, a separate CNG fueling station open to the public on that land. So we'll be issuing an RFI um, to get some information on how that can be done, uh, but that's sort of what we're hoping to do in terms of where we end up with our own internal fueling station. So um, we're looking forward to continuing to work with you. It is a solid commitment from our board to uh, move ahead as quickly as possible, and uh, I think you'll see a really significant difference in the number of buses that are CNG capable in the next few years. Thank you, Mr. Huffer. Questions? Councilman Sharp. Well, I, I'm very pleased to see the uh, uh, ATA board taking that position. As, as uh, at least uh, I think some of us know, uh, there are other uh, bus fleets, like in Fort Worth, where, where they've been all CNG for some time, except for a few of the over-the-road buses. And uh, this purchase, we don't know exactly the number you'll be purchasing because it depends on, on uh, the bid. But uh, right. With, with what you already have and these, that's almost 10% of their fleet, you know, right there. And then uh, if you can find a, a cheaper method of conversion that still gives you a, a long uh, uh, lifespan for use of the bus, uh, we can see some real measurable changes. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Mark, kind of the same question I asked Sam. Uh, uh, you're doing the RFI now. And, and uh, of course, this is what we want to see, not only something convenient for you, but, again, another fueling station the public can use. Any idea what kind of timeline we're looking on, uh, looking at as far as the actual uh, construction and operation of it? 
Yeah, we want to move qu as quickly as possible because while Sam's graciously opened up the fueling station, it's obviously not as convenient uh, for us as to have it on our own property. So the quicker we can be on our own property, the better it is. Right. Um, and the quicker you can start saving money. Exactly. Um, so we would anticipate something being issued in terms of an RFI within a few weeks, and you know, I would hope that we would have an answer um, of some kind within by summer and maybe have something open late fall or, or uh, early 2013. Or 2014, I'm sorry. Wow, that's great. Anyone else? Um, how is the uh, federal funding for fleet replacement going to affect your plans? Um, the, I mean, that's a very good question. Uh, that, that's probably the unknown. Traditionally, um, we get most of our bus replacement money from the FTA, Federal Transit Administration. Um, we have a two-year uh, transportation bill, as you know, that expires in, in federal fiscal year 14. Um, I think we're pretty good for the next two years in terms of bus replacement. We'll have to see what happens in that next transportation bill, and it's certainly something we're following and, and working with your lobbyist as well, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, hearing no other questions, I want to thank you both for coming and updating us up on this. Uh, this is an area that I know uh, we are kind of hiding our light under a bushel basket. Uh, frankly, it tires me sometimes to go to U.S. Conference of Mayors and hear other cities getting awards for stuff that we did 10 years ago. Um, we should be doing that ourselves. And so I encourage you to, you know, take the basket off the light and let it shine and uh, talk about the good things. Because if we're not talking about the good things and telling our story, somebody else is going to tell the story for us, and they won't be nearly as kind. So help us out in that regard. Thank you for everything that you do. If there aren't any other questions or statements, Councilman Sharp. Well, Mr. Mayor, and at the National League of Cities, we have been very visible, and, and uh, Cindy and Jan know uh, uh, Sam has presented there. So at least that organization, I think we're getting the credit that we should. But I don't think a lot of people in Kansas City have any idea of the leadership role we're taking. I agree. Thank you both. Appreciate it. We have a fairly short agenda today. The next item of business is discussion of ordinances, resolutions, communications on today's docket or for floor resolution, or I'm sorry, floor introduction. Is there any discussion yes. of any ordinance, resolution, or communication? Councilman Reed. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. I uh, wanted to uh, let everyone know that I'm going to be introducing from the floor. I've had an opportunity to speak with the Chair of Plans and Zoning about uh, an ordinance for Horace Mann School. Uh, it is to authorize some additional funds uh, to the contract. I think everyone's aware of the building structure of Horace Mann and that it needs to be torn down. Um, we have to spend the NSP dollars by March 11th, uh, 2013, and uh, the staff is in need of this um, uh, to be introduced from the floor so that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, get the process rolling and get the invoices in for more um, for the best for the abatement work that uh, has already been done and so I wanted to allow for everyone to know that I'll be introducing that from the floor uh, today all right councilman sharp thank you very much mr. mayor uh, as you and I talked earlier uh, regarding our state legislative agenda as the council may recall we adopted <coughs> our state legislative agenda fairly early uh, uh, this fall in October, which w was very good because that gives us time to work on it and to let our legislative delegation know what we're supporting. And then later we uh, added one more resolution, which added two more priorities. Since then, however, uh, a consensus agenda for economic development uh, has been signed off on by all of the uh, organizations that really work in this field in Kansas City. Uh, we didn't have that agenda available at the time that we adopted our legislative platform. But I'll, I'll pass this copy of it out. I think everyone's seen it, but the agencies that signed off on this are, are the Greater Kansas City Chamber, the Civic Council, the Economic Development Corporation, the Down, Downtown Council, and Platte County Economic Development Council. And, and we really fostered uh, in the last term having such a consensus agenda because we were hearing from some of our legislators that the chamber had come in with one set of priorities and the city had have another. And uh, 
there was a feeling that we should develop a short list of, of the most important things in economic development, and uh, that has now been finalized by these groups, and all of these are issues that we've talked about and, and dealt with in, in our priorities. The Angel Investment uh, Act, uh, providing uh, tax incentives for data centers, uh, improving the Missouri Quality Jobs Act, uh, implementation and full funding of the SIRA, uh, eliminating the, the cross-border rating uh, for the Kansas City metropolitan area, supporting uh, uh, existing incentive programs, and extending the uh, deadline for use of land assemblage tax credits, which could certainly help in the Bannister Mall area. Uh, so all of these are our issues, but, but we haven't gone back and, and formally approved this. Uh, the other agencies ha have done this uh, and just final finalized the approvals earlier this month. So it's, uh, I wanted to introduce this from the floor and so we could formally join them so our lobbyists can say we've formally adopted them as well. All right. Thank you, Councilman Sharp. Anyone else? Nothing else in that regard. Are there any items that anyone wants placed on future business session agendas? Hearing none, then the next item of business is closed session. Is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I move we go into closed session to address legal matters and sealed bids and related documents pursuant to paragraph 610.021, parentheses 1 and parentheses 2 of the Missouri Revised Statute. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we go into closed session to discuss legal matters and closed items and sealed bids uh, related to documents pursuant to 610.021 and 12. Um, is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, will the clerk please call the roll? Wagner? Aye. Davis? Aye. Ford? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Curls? Aye. Reed? Aye. Um, Circo, I'm sorry. Aye. Glover? Aye. Markison? Aye. Brooks? Aye. Taylor? Aye. Sharp? Aye. James? Aye. 13 ayes? We're in closed session. Thank you.